G'day, I'm Tim Thompson. Today I'm at a mixed grazing property in the Yarra Valley called Kilfenora and I'm speaking with the property's manager, Mr Gavin Wall, who's an internationally renowned sheep and cattle judge and has run operations across multiple states in Australia. He's running this property according to regenerative ag principles and one of the things that he's investing his time and money in is the promotion and growth of dung beetle populations. And this is a fantastic topic and it's a really fascinating one in Australia because we didn't actually have many species of dung beetles that would cope with European animals up until their recent introduction. Gavin's been working with these animals since the early 90s, so let's have a chat with him about what he's using them for and how he's breeding them on this property. <laughs> G'day Gavin, how are you mate? Hello Tim, great day. Oh it's fantastic, thank you for having us out. Now you've got something behind you here that looks a little bit suspicious doesn't it, in a good way? Very can much you, so, yes. Can um, you tell us a little bit about what's going on here? Yes, this was a, uh, originally a raised garden bed but today it encloses some very important little critters, dung beetles. And it's the variety called Vaca, V-A-C-C-A. And they're important little vuckers, aren't they? <laughs> they are. Uh, I came, became interested in dung beetles quite a number of years ago when I met a man called John Fian. Yep. And John Fian has been involved with the CSIRO, or the former CSIRO uh, dung beetle program, uh, introducing, collecting the beetles from various overseas country, breeding them up, and then when they came to Australia, he's been probably one person who's done more for the introduction of dung beetles than any other individual other than perhaps Dr. Borna Missa, whose, whose idea it was to introduce dung beetles into Australia. Well, here we have the uh, what I call the dung beetle nursery. It's a very simple enclosure made up of a raised garden bed, which you can buy pretty near anywhere nowadays. And uh, it's covered with a shade cloth because dung beetles do like to fly. Uh, depending on the species is when they do fly but we need to cover them so that we can contain them in here and we feed them about every, it depends on the time of the year, every three to four or five days. So in we go. Dinner, dinner bell. Uh, what did you do today? Uh, I served lunch to the dung beetle. And I'm not going to lick the plate. There we go. They'll be happy. Well, have a look at that, Gavin. Look at all this scarification of the yeah. ground. I mean, there's just holes galore. Uh, very much so. It's been well and truly ventilated. It's been well and truly... Uh, the, the manure that's been put in here, I, I haven't weighed it, but it would be a considerable volume. Yeah. Here's the one that went in last Friday. Yes. And uh, we're just going to take the top off here and have a look to see how busy they are. There we are. So there's two types of dung beetle that we've introduced to Australia, aren't there, Gavin? Yes, there's the, the uh, tunnelers, which dig tunnels down and lay their eggs down in those tunnels, and there's the ball roller, which they roll the ball away. Amazingly, the ball, which is much, much heavier than they are, but they, they roll the ball away a, a little bit of a distance from the source, and then either hide it in some vegetation or dig just a very shallow little hole to bury it in. Tunnelists, they work in a combination where the female does all the digging and the male is upstairs processing the fresh uh, cow manure, cow dung. So the male eats and the female well, tunnels. They, they all Sounds eat. Sounds fair. Yes, the female does all the work. Uh, the, the male will process the dung to about a plasticine type consistency. So he's sucking off the juice, yep. sustaining himself. Yep and then spits out in his seeds then he'll pass that egg to the female she'll take it right down to the bottom of the tunnel yep. and she'll come back to the surface and get some fresh topsoil to put a plug between that last dung ball and the next one when they hatch out the the new dung beetle will dig a fresh tunnel to the surface. So doesn't got, use the existing tunnel? No it doesn't because it would have to dig through maybe its brother's 
right. sisters. Yes. So it's digging a fresh tunnel, so we've got the aeration, we've got that manure going into the soil profile, so all of that, the nutrient benefits buried in there. Yep. Now the dung beetle itself will only eat about one third of that dung ball that's buried in the soil. So again, instead of this dung being on top of the surface and either volatilising and going like a dry hard chip, Yep, losing or, all that nitrogen. When it rains, washed off into the near waterway, yep. we've got it in the soil. And the soil is going to benefit and the plants are going to benefit. When it rains, more infiltration of the water into that. When the plants are growing, the roots are going to go down deeper and access that nutrient and moisture deeper. So a plus, plus, plus for everyone here. Dung beetles are your friend. They work for free. If we look after them, everyone will benefit. It won't be just the farmer where these, these dung beetles are buried, the dung on his farm. It will be his neighbour that benefits as well. Now, if that neighbour's only got a house block, they won't have as many flies in the summertime. Yep. And they will benefit. So the impacts of having a farm next door and the social sustainability of having dung beetles, your neighbours will like you. They'll leave you alone and let you do your job. Absolutely. Everyone benefits with dung beetles. All right, well, we better move these cattle then um, and have a look at the process of seeding a paddock from your nursery uh, with dung beetles. Wonderful. According to John Fan, Australia's leading dung beetle expert, the 28 million cattle in Australia drop 300 million cow pats a day, adding up to about 500,000 tonnes of dung. About 40% of the nutrients in the grass that the cattle eat isn't processed and remains in the cow pats. Dung beetles can turn 80% of that remaining nutrient into plant food. I don't know about you, but I'm seeing a lot of free fertiliser walking past me right now. At this stage, I haven't released any from this nursery as yet, but today is the day. You've picked a very good day because today the steers are going to go into the paddock right there. Yep. And that's the way the breeze is coming from today. So I've actually turned up for once at the right time. You're very much on time, Tim. <laughs> And I can, hear, I can hear buzzing under here, I can see, hear the dung beetles trying to get out at the moment. So when we take the cover off, a few will fly out, more than likely. That's okay, they're probably excited to be out. Do. So we'll unfurl that. And there goes one. And away they go. Straight off, and there goes another one. So if I'm a small landholder and I'm really interested in dung beetles and I'm passionate about dung beetles, it's probably not worth me having a nursery unless I work cooperatively with a group of people around me and there are livestock on either side of me. Exactly, yes. And all of those, your neighbours are conscious of what you need to do to look after dung beetles and the benefits of them. So Gavin, thanks for sharing a little bit of knowledge and information about the dung beetles. And it's not just the dung beetles, is it? I mean, you were telling me earlier off camera that there's even mites that live on dung beetles that predate fly larvae. I mean, we're talking about a whole ecosystem here. You've gone to the point where you've done a bird audit on this property and you're looking at and um, analysing the populations of birds because you see them as being incredibly important in managing your pest populations and your productivity. You're planting tree lines along boundary fences, you're planting whole, out whole paddocks to trees. Um, you're really trying to increase the biodiversity of the whole property, not just the dung beetle population. Exactly. We have to look at the whole farm, the whole farm plan. Just as, like I said, a jigsaw puzzle. We need to put all of the parts of that jigsaw puzzle on the page yep. so that it all works cohesively together and everyone benefits. Because, for instance, you know, the water that runs off this property is cleaner than one that, that may have not have been managed the same, etc. Yeah. There are lots yeah. of ways to look at it. Dung beetles benefit the whole community, no matter where you live. Now you've had good experience with leading community groups in the establishment of not only dung beetle prop colonies but also whole farm planning and so on. You've actually started a land care group and you've had good and bad experiences with that. Generally bad at the start and good at the end because people don't like change. You're right. Change is, is difficult to implement sometimes but you know my life experience, I spent uh, six years on a local government council at Shepparton so I learned how to work with people and it's better to work with them rather than against them yep. and convince them that there is benefit there for them and benefit for everyone. So that's my style of, of working in the community and I find it extremely rewarding to do the things that I have done in life. And at my stage in life, 
I need to be able to pass that information on to others so it doesn't go with me. I sincerely hope I've got a lot more time to do those things, <laughs> but uh, one never knows. Now, Gavin, you're also farming some Wilshires here, um, and as people can see, they look quite healthy. You also are really cautious with the types of drenches and your, your drenching program to be dung beetle friendly, and that's, that's critical as yeah. well, isn't it? Ask the question before you go and purchase any product. Is it dung beetle friendly? And there are chemical options out there that do work in with holistic grazing management, but it's very important to note that there are particularly some older chemi chemistries that don't. Yes, and in a case of a certain product, which we won't mention, is that it doesn't kill the old beetles, yep. but it kills off All the young a ones. lot of the young productive beetle. So you don't see an immediate drop in the population but later on there's yeah. a flow through. One of the things that we haven't mentioned is when the dung beetles emerge they go and have a BNS party yep. and if I've seen a BNS party of dung beetles and it's like a beehive, yeah. a swarm of bees. I've seen a cow pat and meters around just covered in dung beetles so they feast then, pair up and away they go. So if you're conscious of when dung beetles are hatching, you avoid those times. If you can't get the dung beetle friendly, friendly product, and I'd encourage you to, yep, just be careful. Just avoid when you do. breeding times. Yep. Yeah, and that'll of course depend seasonally on the variety and the species that yep. you have. Gavin, thank you very much for your time. You've not only taken the time to talk to us about dung beetles, but very importantly, you've talked to us about whole farm planning and holistic grazing management, um, rotating, using appropriate chemical interventions where required but avoiding them at all as much as possible auditing your, your local wildlife and looking for biodiversity um, it's really important that we get this message across what do you think is the biggest reason why people don't take the leap into regenerative ag wearing an old pair of shoes or an old hat's always very comfortable changing your method of management can always be uh, uncomfortable and pose some challenges but there are now enough people out there to assist you don't be afraid to ask for help. So you're, you really think we are at that point now where we're past the early adopters yes. and you think that the majority of people can actually benefit from this? I, I certainly believe so and I, and I believe we don't have an option we cannot continue the path that has been taken in the past in my 50 years 60 years farming. Gavin, it's always a pleasure, mate. I really value the chats that we have. And uh, guys, if you want to know more, don't forget timthompson.ag. And uh, Gavin, hopefully we'll have you on the channel again. Anytime, Tim. Good on you, Pleasure. Mate.